Hello everyone, my name is Gil Penalosa and this is the webinar series Cities for Everyone, where every other week we have fascinating guests that come to talk about their experiences, how to create cities that are more equitable and more sustainable, where everyone can live healthier and happier. Originally, I'm from Bogota, Colombia, where I led the construction of over 200 parks and I've been living in Toronto, Canada, for 25 years this May. I created 880 cities and also cities for everyone. And I have been fortunate to have worked in over 350 cities in all continents, sharing and learning. In some of these cities, actually, I work with Carol Colera and she's our guest today. She's an amazing person, an urbanist, a doer, and I worked with her in Miami and St. Paul and other places, but now she lives in Memphis, Tennessee, where she has led an amazing project of a large park on the Mississippi River with the idea of creating an inclusive place for everyone. And her topic, which includes this part, but broader than that is, can we still make public places for everyone? Carol, thank you. How are you? Welcome. I, I am great, Gil. Glad to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I've known Carol for many, many years. She's an amazing woman, a great urbanist, but also is a doer, a doer. And when I invited Carol, I explained, I said the, the purpose, I created this webinar uh, about three years ago was to help people become passionate advocates, passionate on whatever they want. I don't tell them on what, it can be on trees, it can be on parks, on public spaces, on walkability, but we need to create cities that are more equitable and more sustainable. So this is not just an academic exercise. Oh, you know, this is interesting. No, 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 this is not an academic exercise. So everybody that I invite are people that have done. So Carol, tell us a little bit about yourself. Also share the screen. You can take your time. Carol, we have people from over 30 countries connected right now uh, who are eager to learn from your experience because one of these things about public spaces is that is 90% of what you're gonna say, I'm, I'm confident is applicable anywhere. They might be specific things, but also people, let's keep in mind that each place is different, each neighborhood is different, each city. So it's not about copying and pasting, but it is, we can adapt and improve lots of ideas. Carol, welcome. Thank you, Gil. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, we see and we hear you perfect. Perfect, okay. Uh, well, I love this topic. Can we still make public spaces for everyone? And like you, Gil, I I've been involved in the making of public places for a very long time. Uh, early in my career, yes, 1975, with a lot of blonde hair, uh, I was working on the uh, real estate in the Central Business Improvement District in downtown Memphis, including the city's uh, Main Street, trying to reinvent that. Um, and then assisted mayors uh, in really key pieces of real estate, rethinking those, reimagining those at Mayor's Institute on City Design, providing research to mayors and civic leaders through CEOs for Cities, uh, supporting creative placemaking at Art Place, uh, then adopting a really strong focus on great places as part of our um, strategy at great places as a strategic advantage to cities and their success at Knight Foundation, where we then, several of us, co-founded Reimagining the Civic Commons, got a chance to reinforce and amplify that work at the Kresge Foundation, and now full circle back to my hometown in Memphis. Uh, over um, the past five years, I've spent trying to transform the city's long neglected and long disconnected uh, riverfront. And I keep thinking, Gil, it will get easier, but it doesn't get any easier. So it's a great opportunity for us, I, for for your wonderful webinar series, which we all should support, and uh, and to get a chance to, to think together with colleagues about how we make uh, public spaces and why we make public space and why it's so urgent to make great public spaces today. Um, 
you know, there are a number of trends underway. We all know what they are. Office building occupancy, it's still under capacity and delivery continues to gut a lot of retail and um, restaurants. The crime legacy of COVID and some say the work from home trend are combining to cause people to go out less and they go out earlier, contributing not only to less vibrancy, but also to this growing crisis of loneliness, um, which, uh, you know, is beginning to get more play. It started pre-COVID, but COVID certainly accelerated it. The concentration of people on the streets has diminished and it's shifted to new geography that leaves some familiar public spaces without their usual users and making public spaces, we were talking about this earlier, making new public places is just fraught with challenges from opponents of change whose comments are now really made easy and they're amplified by social media, which then encourages cycles of vitriol. And we've experienced that and probably many of you on this call have too. So all of that comes on top of a five decade trend toward neighborhoods and schools becoming hyper segregated in terms of incomes. Now, why does that matter? Sounds a little uh, niche here. You know, we're going to be concerned with income segregation. But most of you on this call are likely familiar with Raj Chetty's great work that concludes that creating loose tie networks among people across the income spectrum, from high income to low income, is critically important to the ability of low income people to climb the economic ladder. Now, what's a loose tie network? It's the kind of network that people with high incomes form on the job uh, and in college, and uh, people with low incomes form in their neighborhoods. Um, it's the kind of network you use to make friends, find jobs, uh, find a life partner. Um, and obviously the wider your network, uh, the better your chances of success. And you know that's not only true of people, it's also true for cities. You're probably familiar with the work of Sean Safford um, long ago, who studied, had a famous book, Why the Garden Club Couldn't Save Youngstown. And it, it, he makes the point that self-referential and overlapping civic networks tend not to challenge the prevailing wisdom. And when it's wrong, it's spectacularly wrong because the network is not Diversified, diversified networks are more resilient networks and they lead to more resilient people. So historically, loose tie networks were easier to form because people with more money and people with less money tended to live in closer proximity. Their kids often went to school together uh, or they played together in summer sports leagues, uh, Low income, high income people might work together in the same place, go to the same place of worship together. But today, that in the U.S., that's much less likely. We we really are in an age of hyper segregation in terms of income. And that creates what I believe is a new urgency for us to invest in making public spaces, public places for everyone. And in this context, when I say everyone, I, I don't mean it as code for people who have historically been unwelcomed in public spaces. Now, do the people who have historically been unwelcomed in public spaces deserve special attention? Absolutely. Um, but when I say everyone, I mean everyone because it's the mixing across a range of incomes that matters in creating economic opportunity. So first, I think we have to get people who aren't used to being in close proximity to one another to occupy the same space at the same time if we have any hope of creating loose tie networks among the hypersegregated. Think of 
the foundational condition for places for everyone at minimum um, to be spaces that foster an indifference to difference that then becomes an openness to otherness, places where difference is rendered routine and unremarkable. And then ideally we get those people across incomes to mix in space with one another in a way that over time, over time turns into valuable loose time networks that lead to expanding, expanded social and economic opportunity. Now, look, this may be, that's why I'm glad I'm on this call with you because this, this may be wonky. There could be better language that I could use to describe what I'm talking about. Um, but this is, I believe, the new value proposition for public space. This opportunity to mix, to, to fill in the wide gap that we now have uh, of, of places and activities that bring us together um, instead of separate us. And um, I challenge you, I challenge myself to be a maker of public space to grab this opportunity. Um, now, let, let me caveat here. Uh, not all public places are platforms for this kind of income mixing. And that's fine. There are good, very good reasons, good equity reasons to create good quality of life reasons to create great public spaces that serve their immediate neighborhoods, even if it means that mixing is unlikely. Some of it is just playing catch up after years of disinvestment in low income neighborhoods. And that too is an equity play and it's an important one. But the, the more complex and uncertain and sometimes politically incorrect equity play is to invest in spaces that transcend that geographic hypersegregation, that transcend our tribal instincts and seduce people of all incomes to use them. At the payoff, while it's not assured, it's really tricky to pull off, uh, perhaps now more than ever, the promise is absolutely worth the effort. I, I want to tell you briefly about making our attempt, our attempt to make such a place in on the Memphis Riverfront uh, at Tom Lee Park. We have this amazing piece of real estate, 31 acres on the Mississippi River. It is at once adjacent to downtown, but it's also within walking or biking distance of the poorest zip codes in our city and frankly in our state. And, and one that is actually six blocks from the new entrance to our park uh, is one of the poorest zip codes in America. It This, this piece of land, this 31 acre park called Tom Lee Park, sits on top of a um, Corps of Engineers, uh, US Army Corps dike wall uh, and it's named, it was named in 1954 when it was a spot of property. This is the expansion of the park that was done in 91, but it was named in 54 uh, for this man, Tom Lee, who in 1925 used his small skiff boat that he used to deliver packages on the Mississippi River. Um, he used his skiff boat, his courage, his deep sense of humanity to save 32 people from drowning in the Mississippi when the Army Corps boat they were on began sinking into a stormy river. Now, after enduring uh, the kind of controversy that, a company, that accompanies all ambitious public space projects these days. Uh, the park opened last September and the response has been wildly enthusiastic. I'm gonna show you a few pictures. I'm not gonna dwell on it, uh, but it really is a spectacular new landscape. It was designed by uh, the architecture firm Studio Gang and the landscape architecture firm uh, Scape. And uh, you can just see some of the pictures, uh, wonderful photographs of this park that has just been uh, embraced by the citizens of Memphis 
uh, just uh, since its opening in September. Uh, this piece of art, a monument to listening, was supported by the Mellon Foundation done by Theaster Gates uh, as uh, inspired by Tom Lee's story, which we're very excited to have. We also have uh, James Little, another artist who happens to be a native Memphian who did this spectacular court uh, under the sunset canopy adopting uh, uh, adapting one of his artworks, Democratic Experiment, uh, and allowed us to use it um, in this canopy that uh, remembers Tyree Nichols, a young man who was uh, brutally beaten to death by Memphis police officers, and, um, and honoring his parents who really called for calm uh, at the, the worst moment of their lives. Uh, again, a magnificent act of courage and uh, a, a really strong uh, memory of him there at the, as the centerpiece of the park. Uh, it is a um, it has brought to a very barren piece of land <clears throat> a magnificent landscape thanks to Scape uh, that is on uh, North America's largest flyway, and uh, and we've used this opportunity to build a um, a continuum of opportunity, uh, starting with school children, a curriculum developed by Kate Orff at Scape, uh, continuing to 14,000 kids visiting us this spring on learning field trips to internships, to apprenticeships, to jobs. And we're so excited to be uh, committed to building what we believe will be the next generation of Riverfront champions um, uh, in, in the park. And since it's opening on, oh, and certainly let me say uh, a word about our phenomenal rangers who are all, who all believe in this mixing um, mandate we have, uh, and and enter into it with real with ideas, with uh, excitement, uh, with commitment uh, to making this the kind of park we all believe it can be. Not just clean and safe, although clean and safe matters, but also to to have to build a brand new culture um, that. Uh, is is taking people are recognizing it. Uh, we've we've had spectacular national attention. This is just a a tiny bit of uh, the headlines. It was an um, it was nice to see photos of Tom Lee Park uh, being uh, and a monument to listening. The Astor's piece being uh, used uh, in New York Times as illustrating the the new Mellon commitment to continuing the monument project that Mellon has made, uh, again, breathtaking commitment by that foundation. But I also want to show you how locals are responding. This is interesting. Uh, in our first couple of months, we had about 100,000 people uh, visit the park from 33 zip codes. And uh, so, you know, for those of you who don't know, Memphis is the, is a, the U.S. Uh, largest uh, majority Black city. And so these demographics uh, are... Uh, are a good reflection of our community. What's remarkable uh, is that 94% of the people who visited in those first couple of months said uh, the park was, uh, cleanliness was good or excellent, uh, which I believe would be hard to find in most places in, um, in our city. And even more remarkable was there was was the fact that 88% of our visitors said safety was good or excellent. And at a time of uh, you know rising fears about crime and safety and uncertainty, uh, these were, we believe, uh, remarkable um, results from, from, the, from the park. And then a number that we can't quite believe or explain yet, but we love it, is that 57% of the people who visited said they met new people in the park. And again, if you're going to get mixing, that's kind of a nice place to start with people saying they met new people. So that is all, you know, we're, we're so excited about what we've, the results to date. And frankly, we're still trying to figure out what's working and um, and to try to make sense of the, the lessons that, uh, are being reported by rangers, not just for 
us, but it we hope that we can learn enough with others to share it so that we all get smarter, faster to make public spaces that can actually live up to this, um, you know, this new mandate for mixing. Here's what we think we know, uh, think uh, being the operative word here. Uh, so to be a public space that is a candidate for socioeconomic mixing, we believe these are the elements that are required. The right location that is easily and naturally naturally accessible to both high income, low income people. It helps if it doesn't feel like anyone at either end of that income spectrum owns the space, um, that it really can be a space for everyone. So number one, I, I, second is allure. It, it's got to have a, enough allure, enough seduction to attract people who financially can 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 choose to be anywhere they want to be. Um, luring them sometimes into public space, particularly in sprawling cities like ours, um, can be difficult. And uh, so we think allure is critical. And thank you for Studio Gang and Scape uh, in making an alluring space. Um, something that I think I gave short shrift to during the during the design process in terms of meeting this goal. But pro, the program um, that together we developed, uh, not only with the design team, but also with the community uh, and with teenagers in, in the community, uh, has been essential. It, it, it creates reasons for people to gather, to linger, and then return often. And, and it also makes, um, it, it helps us keep the place safe and civil. So we think these are like, you know, the elements that are, these are requirements. Um, and then to create loose tie networks in these places, first you gotta get people there. And we think that's what it takes to get mixed income people there. And then you wanna create the relationships among them, the loose tie networks. We believe then you've got to create a culture of uh, respect for the place and for the people, uh, a culture of generosity that gets operationalized through welcoming and belonging and hosting. And you saw our Rangers with the we're all neighbors. Um, high neighbor uh, has been a theme for us. And we think that's um, it goes much farther than that. We loan equipment. There, there are a number of ways in which we attempt to operationalize these things. Um, and then the programming versus the program, the programming that we do, we're trying to create opportunities for people to experience joy um, together, preferably repeatedly and over time, because the research suggests that the potency of parks for social cohesion derives from the fleeting and unanticipated interactions and the weak ties that they promote. So that's that's where uh, that's what our programming is um, aimed at. So this is um, admittedly an early working theory. We are, of course, still trying things, learning things, uh, rejecting things, gathering research, uh, moving these concepts around, you know, what begets what, uh, what is essential, what is um, what needs to be operationalized, how do you operationalize it? Uh, we're renaming these things um, and we're asking advice from colleagues, including you, about uh, their own experiences. And and I really I'm concluding my email in, in, in the last slide so that I hope you will email me with um, your experience and maybe we can start some conversations. Um, we're particularly interested in maybe creating a network of colleagues who see, as we do, this opportunity for public space to fill, um, again, what I've talked about in the U.S., this growing gap in places where that socioeconomic mixing occurs, the kind of mixing that we believe uh, is essential to, it enables empathy, which then enables community, which is essential to opportunity, all of which I think um, are foundational for democracy. Making public space is important. Making public space that functions as mixing ground for communities 
that 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 mixing ground that's missing is critical work. Um, I salute you for doing this work. Um, my email is here. Don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Gil, I'm ready to take any questions or um, invite a conversation for the rest of the time we have together. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very, very much, Carol. And I want to thank all of the participants from all over the world. And I hope to see everyone uh, two weeks from today, same time. Thank you and all the best. Keep up that amazing work, helping live, everyone live older, healthier, happier. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. What a fascinating story of how you brought an idea into a beautiful park for people of all ages and abilities. How you showed us that public places are magnificent areas where people of all races and ethnicities and social or economic backgrounds can meet as equals and can enjoy life and be how this is good for their mental and physical and social health and also for the environment, but also to have fun and games and the role of having programs and activities. Thank you, Carl, because you have taught us a lesson. And on this bi-weekly webinar today, we had hundreds and hundreds of people from more than 30 countries. And the idea is that hopefully everyone will have received an injection of doers, how to get things done. Doism, I mean, making up of words, but that's what you show that there are many obstacles, but we must overcome those obstacles to get things done. If we want to have cities that are more equitable and more sustainable, where everyone will be able to live healthier and happier. I'll see everyone two weeks from now at the same time. And I hope that once you see this presentation, you will share it with elected officials, with public sector staff, with private sector, with foundations, with everyone, so that others will be able to benefit from Carl's wisdom, knowledge, experience. Thank you.